Es un verdadero honor de estar con ustedes. Yo soy italiana, entonces cuando hablo español parezco una argentina, porque los argentinos piensan de ser italianos, pero no lo son. Y bueno, voy a continuar en inglés, si no, no me van a entender. So it's a real honor to be able to, you know, do the first lecture for you all. It's, it's very much going to be about how to have better policies requires actually beginning with first principles of asking what is the role of policy? What is the role of the state in the economy? What does it mean to actually design public-private partnerships with a really ambitious notion of what the public part is about? You know, we have business schools worldwide trying to help corporate managers rethink their organizations, make sure their organizations don't become inertial, slow, too bureaucratic. But when we see bureaucracy in the government, we just say it's too bureaucratic. <laughs> we don't think, how do we uh, uh, redesign a bureaucracy to be creative, to be dynamic, to be entrepreneurial, to be innovative, and to absolutely create value, co-create value, co-create markets, not just fix problems when they arise. So this will be the, the key concept of my talk. Let me share my screen now. This is usually the hardest bit. Okay. Uh, bon. Is the screen, let me just make sure it's on. There we go. So what I'd like to do is to share with you this notion of putting purpose, public purpose, at the center of policymaking, and to do so with a concrete idea of missions, yeah, la misión al centro de la política económica, de la economía política, and what does it mean for the policy design, and really, again, for the design of the partnership between the public and the private sector. And the institute, which I founded and direct, uh, I founded it almost three years ago, was very much set up with this idea because I had written books and papers about the state needing to think differently, to co-create value, not just to fix market failures. But on the one hand, I met a lot of thirst, a lot of willingness in governments to change how they were operating. And on the other hand, the tools on the ground, the way we think about the debt, the deficit, procurement, just it wasn't changing fast enough. So this idea of both designing policies to be more ambitious but to get our hands dirty with what does it really then mean for the tools on the ground, for the accounting, for the culture in an organization, for the design of the procurement, the grants, the industrial strategy. This is, I think, the, the challenge. So what we would like to do is to share with you also our experience in working globally around this notion of transforming the status quo thinking around innovation policy, industrial strategy, to really be challenge oriented, to be able to be as ambitious as the goals that are inside our, you know, 17 sustainable development goals, to backtrack and ask what does it mean for how we do things every day differently. Um, the talk today, the lesson, will be structured in four different areas. The first, I want to convince you why we need to talk more about the direction of growth, less about the rate. <laughs> uh, the second will be how to do this, how to talk about the direction of growth through missions and to use a mission-oriented design to our policies. The third will backtrack and also think about value. What does it mean when we have mission-oriented policies around challenges to then construct the relationship between the different actors in the economy so they are sharing both the risks and the rewards. So sharing the creation, but also the distribution. And I think this is very important in Latin America, by the way, where often the progressive uh, parties or the progressive economists have focused in some ways too much about the redistribution and not enough about the pre-distribution, how to get the conditions right in the first place to produce less inequality not just afterwards to have to redistribute uh, the wealth in a more progressive way, even though redistribution is very important as well. 
And fourth, I'd like to finish with some examples that I've been working on recently with the uh, Inter-American Development Bank uh, around examples in Colombia, in Chile, and Mexico around mission-oriented policies, and to especially then finish with the question of what might this look like in Peru. So first, on the direction of growth. So this is, I think, a moment, this moment that I'm speaking to you, the moment that we are all living, a very exciting one for you to be taking this course because there's so much talk about direction. Uh, there's lots of talk about it, but not enough grounding in how to do things differently. But let's just pause a moment and admit that it's a very good moment for the talk because <laughs> there's a lot of it. So five years ago, the sustainable development goals were set. They have been agreed on globally uh, by almost every country, Peru, of course, included. There's 17 goals with 169 targets beneath them. Um, and you know, people talk about them all the time, the SDGs. And the question is, what do they mean for how we structure our economy, for how we think about interdepartmental and intersectoral working together, for the investment pathway for the industrial strategy? We also have a big global discussion about the Green New Deal and the Green Transition. In the United States, this has been led by very young Congresswoman uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and she managed to convince the Democratic Party to talk this language. In Europe, the Green Deal is now at the center of the European transformation, to the point that now with the COVID recovery, the conditions that are being set on the individual countries is no longer austerity, which was the condition after the financial crisis, to receive funds from Europe, but the conditions are on investments towards the climate uh, mitigation strategies and digitalization. But there's lots of talk about all the different countries requiring a green deal. Sweden has made it a, a, a national mission to have a green welfare state, so a fossil free welfare state. And at the city level, lots of different discussions like in Copenhagen. Um, and industrial strategy has come back in many countries after decades of being a blasphemy. <laughs> you couldn't use the word industrial strategy without people thinking you were a communist. <laughs> so anyway, all these discussions, and I know this is also true of Latin America. I was recently in different panels with um, Alicia Barcena from CEPAL, where you know lots of discussions in Latin America about the green transition, about the SDGs, about growing in a more sustainable, inclusive way. So this is positive, it's wonderful. Yes, great conversation. However, <laughs> this is now the bad side. We don't know how to do it. We continue to pretend that policy, the policymaker is simply there to fix a market failure. You actually have to wait for the market to fail. So not enough investments in areas like research or too much investment in pollution for the state to come in and to fix the problem. So the idea is that you fix the negative externality problem with a carbon tax, the public good or positive externality problem with some funding of something, or information asymmetries. You come in and you help the small companies. And all these different failures that need to be fixed is how we design policy. So we're always too little, too late. <laughs> because you have to actually wait for something to fail before you enter. And a lot of what we do in IIPP, our institute that is speaking to you today and over the next uh, classes, is saying this is where we need to rethink completely. We need a different framework for policy for the state if we are gonna be ambitious around the directions. And that needs to be around co-creating and co-shaping markets, not just fixing them. And the reason is because if you don't have that framework of co-shaping and co-creating uh, co oh instead God. of fixing, you end up with these very stupid assumptions <laughs> and stupid policies, which continue to pretend that value is created in business and the policymaker, the Kafka-esque bureaucrat here on the right, is there just to get the rules right, you know, fund the basics like infrastructure, schools, uh, research, and then get the hell out of the way for the market to decide the direction, yeah? 
And yet this directional push that I talked about, the Green Deal, the SDGs, are never going to happen if we don't have both sides, public and private, thinking out of the box, designing their organizations in a creative way, investing, co-investing, taking risks, having a portfolio approach towards those transitions. But the narrative continues to be, like in The Economist, almost every week they say this, that you see here, which is that government doesn't know how to invest. It should simply level the playing field, fix the market failures, enable and de-risk the private sector, and leave the rest to the revolutionaries in business. And so a lot of my work has been about debunking, <laughs> uh, how do you say, uh, uh, you know, destroying the myths, los mitos, uh, behind this. And so I wrote a book called The Entrepreneurial State, which looked back in history and said, look, all the big changes we've had, which have driven growth in capitalism globally, have not happened from a market fixing perspective. It actually required market creating and market shaping by all the different actors in the system. And in fact, all the general purpose technologies that you see here from the internet to green technology would never have happened without the state actually investing, being an investor first resort in some of the higher risk areas, especially with capital intensity. And I'll, in a minute, I'll talk to you why this is not just about developing countries like the United States and the Soviet Union, but the story is even more true in developing countries. But first, what I did in the book was to argue, you know, everything that makes our, our smartphones uh, smart and not stupid was funded by the taxpayer. Uh, internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri, and it was funded by public money, like the internet from DARPA, GPS from the Navy, and so on. But even more interesting is that the funding, the public money, was housed inside public organizations like DARPA that were not thinking about the technology. DARPA did not care about the internet. It had a problem to solve. It needed the satellites to communicate, and the internet was a solution or GPS, the Navy required it to have much more precise positioning of where the ships were in the sea. So really one of the, the important things to ask is what do we know about mission oriented organizations, problem solving organizations? How are they structured? What is their remit? How do they do the budgeting? How do they welcome risk taking? How do they organize their portfolios? in order to be problem oriented? And how do they you know, welcome the risk taking that's required? Because anytime you're gonna try to solve a problem, like learning how to ride a bicycle, <laughs> you will have to fall off the bicycle many times. So trial and error and error and error. And even though the venture capitalists, so the entrepreneurial community brags, they boast that they like risks, when a civil servant, when a public servant, takes risks and sometimes makes mistakes as is normal for any risk taker, they get fired. <laughs> they get put on the front page of the newspaper. They get told to stop picking winners and to go back to simply fixing the market. So this is a huge problem, which historically means that when we had directions, when we had problems to solve, the state actually had to take risks. And yet the narrative of what the state is for doesn't let it take risks. So I was very interested, and this is why I set up IAPP, I wanted to make this a systemic you know, change in how governments were thinking. And the curriculum that we're setting up through our master's program is very much organized around this. What does it mean to have entrepreneurial bureaucracies, risk-taking bureaucracies, which are organized around big problems, yeah? the problems that are very ambitious, like the ones in the Sustainable Development Goals, which are social problems, much harder than some of the technological problems you know, that got us uh, to the moon and back. The internet being one of the you know, spillovers from that. Um, and a colleague of mine, Richard Nelson, wrote a wonderful book in 1977 called The Moon and the Ghetto. He was basically saying, how can it be that you know, in the modern industrial era, 
we got to the moon, <laughs> we put a man on the moon, and we don't know how to get rid of ghettos. We don't know how to get rid of favelas. We still have huge inequality. We have weak healthcare systems, and we got a man on the moon. It's hard to get to the moon, believe me, yeah? So, so this, this, this idea that actually the social problems are even harder than getting to the moon. They require political change, regulatory change, behavioral change, organizational innovation, social innovation, and of course, technological innovation. But they also require admitting that it's urgent. When we go to war, nobody says we don't have the money. No one ever says we don't have money, we will not go to Afghanistan, to Iran, to Iraq, or World War II to fight the war. Why? Because they say it's urgent, it's for security, we go fight the war. They find the money, <laughs> yeah? So what would it look like to treat the sustainable development goals with the same level of urgency that we apply when we go to war or when we go to the moon, but to transform these as concrete missions? These are very general, these challenges. The 17 sustainable development goals are general challenges. I think in Spanish you say desafios or desafios, desafios, sorry, pronouncing it wrong. Sfide, we say in Italian. So we need to transform them into concrete missions. But we also have to change the vocabulary. In IAPP, we always begin with crossing words out. We say, stop saying you're fixing markets. You're creating them. Stop saying you're de-risking the private sector. You're welcoming uncertainty. Stop saying you're leveling the playing field. You have to tilt the playing field towards the direction of change and have a portfolio approach within that to fund as many different possibilities as possible, but also to reward certain types of behavior with your tax system or other types of uh, issues we can talk about later. You're not picking winners, but picking the willing, trying to get as many different actors in the system to move along with you towards a transformation and so on. So this brings me to the second part of the agenda. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question, I was gonna leave 20 minutes at the end, but if you have a burning question, um, I don't know, someone can maybe be looking at the hands being raised, but I think it might be best for me to go on until the end and then we open it up for discussion, uh, if that's okay. So the second part of the agenda is to explain what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> what do I mean when I'm talking about emissions? Why is it different from how we do things? So I, I just mentioned the moon landing, no? the moon and the ghetto. How could we go to the moon and we can't solve the ghetto? First of all, what did it mean to go to the moon? It required real leadership, yeah? You should read the speech by Kennedy back in the early 60s where he said, We're, it's gonna cost a lot of money. <laughs> We're gonna waste a lot of money. We're gonna fail, but it's worth it. And he talked about why it was worth it. He first talked about you know, the need to beat the Russians but he also talked about all the massive technological spillovers that he believed would come about. And they did. The entire software industry, software as a sector, came about as a spillover from trying to get to the moon. No one thought about software. They just needed it in order to get to the moon and back. It required many different sectors to innovate in the private sector. So NASA led it, the Apollo program, but there was a lot of innovation in the private sector in the area of nutrition, materials, electronics, aeronautics, many different companies, large and small. The big companies were General Electric, Motorola, which actually at the time was still small, Honeywell, and some other more uh, medium-sized companies. Um, and it required a huge amount of experimentation. Most of the projects failed. <laughs> we know of the ones that succeeded, but a lot of things failed. And of course, you know that some of the Apollo uh, uh, astronauts actually died along the way. So the failure was also life-threatening. And so what we did in the Institute was to work backwards and say, okay, that was hard, <laughs> but how interesting of what it means to have a really bold goal to begin with a challenge, which at the time was the space race, make it a concrete mission, which has to be targeted. You have to be able to answer yes or no. Did you achieve it? Did you get to the moon and back in a generation? You can answer that. You can't answer the space race, yeah? So begin with the big challenges, like the sustainable development goals, turn them into concrete missions, like getting the plastic out of the ocean, 
right? That's very concrete. If you set yourself an objective of how much plastic over what amount of years and get as many different sectors to work with you along the way. So move away from a sector approach, especially economies with lots of natural resource sectors. Think about how all your different sectors, some of them will be natural resources, some of them will be more on say the, the high tech digital and some will be old sectors like steel, construction, materials, how they can work together towards solving a goal together. But especially on these blue uh, circles on the bottom, what that means for a redesign of policy, procurement, grants, loans, prize schemes to crowd in as much experimentation as possible. Because if you have a linear concept of policy, you know, here's the goal and we're just going to win for sure this amount of money, this amount of output, it's not going to happen. <laughs> the non-linearity, the feedback, the learning, the interdepartmental uh, kind of feedback effects need to be designed within the system in order to foster that kind of creativity and spillover effects that the moon landing had. So again, this is just an example. If you take the, the sustainable development goals 13 and 14, if you take the, the SDG 14 around climate change, this was the example that I wrote about in this report here on the left, which became a Europe law because the parliament voted on the report. It was very nice that I finally wrote something that someone had to vote on in the parliament. Uh, so now it's a missions instrument. And the idea is exactly this. Now you begin with something like climate change, which is very bold and you know, a, a challenge, transform it into a goal of like 100 carbon neutral cities by 2030 with a clear target within that and get all the different sectors from the energy sector, real estate, construction, which is an old sector. It's not you know, a, a modern high tech sector, but it can transform itself to help solve goals, food, uh, the social sector and social services and so on to work together towards solving that problem. So instead of having a, an approach where you choose four top sectors, what you're really choosing is the problem to get all your different sectors to work towards. And all those different projects on the bottom, like a citizen carbon ID card or carbon neutral urban food industry or clean urban electric mobility, buildings with carbon absorbing components. These are just examples of some of the solutions bottom up that would come to the system, but they don't happen out of you know, miracles. They happen through the policy design. And so in Italy, where I'm from, our way of doing procurement, we call it appalto, is very boring. It's very static. It doesn't nurture any bottom up experimentation at all. It's often the usual suspects that are getting the contracts with the public sector. And it's definitely not a um, tool for innovation. If anything, it stifles innovation. And so really rethinking the design of those tools like procurement with already the goal of using them to crowd in that bottom-up experimentation for a public goal is, is a huge revolution. You know, it's easier to come up with a mission, it's much harder to design the tools to crowd in the experimentation to get there. Um, and so what is a mission? You know, I've already said they have to be bold, inspirational with wide societal relevance, uh, have a clear direction, targeted, measurable, and time bound. So you can say yes or no, did you achieve it? They have to be ambitious, but also re you know, realistic. And here I was focusing mainly on the research and innovation system of Europe, but really if you think of it in terms of productive capacity, you want to be pushing the productive capacity to reach new frontiers, but you need to be, of course, working with the existing capacity you have, but bringing together these different areas uh, that maybe just have not worked together because they have been working in silos. Be cross-disciplinary, cross-sectoral, cross-actor, and to drive through bottom-up uh, solutions. How did I get muted? Sorry. Uh, the, the second report called Governing Missions was how do we implement this? What does it mean for who decides the mission? Is it top down Kennedy telling everyone what to do? No. Modern day missions based on the sustainable development goals need to be co created. You don't just tell citizens they need a carbon neutral city, you find ways to bring them together 
at the local level, especially, to design carbon neutral ways of living, to bring different voices to the table. Uh, we need different targets and milestones, which along the way tell us if we're getting closer or not to achieve the missions. If not, we should turn the tap off. Uh, DARPA, which I mentioned before, which invented the internet, was just as good as turning the tap off as it was turning it on. You need proactive portfolio management, so you're not putting all your eggs in one basket, but actually spreading the risk across the space. You need flexible and adaptable organizations that are willing to change what they're doing based on the feedback. You need accountability, and again, having citizens engaged in the accountability is interesting. Um, you need ways to finance and crowd in other forms of finance. So precisely by having missions that are bold and inspirational, you can increase the expectations in the business community of where future growth opportunities lie. Uh, this is why Denmark today is the number one provider of high-tech green services to China, because they have been able to crowd in lots of different types of finance to their national missions, uh, creating a whole startup community around services, green services, not, not just green manufacturing. Um, and they were being able to be, get crowded in also from the venture capital community, but it wouldn't have existed without really strong city level, regional and national uh, missions, which created excitement around the green transition. And we fundamentally need new public sector uh, capabilities. Um, and I've already talked about this, so I'll move on. And what's important in thinking about missions for those of you who have thought about industrial strategy in the past is that it's not that we don't need horizontal policies. Horizontal policies are policies around skills, education, research, and infrastructure, the kind of background basics. You always need that, otherwise the economy is not strong. Really what missions are doing is changing how we think about vertical policies. Vertical policies are policies that in the past, especially in the 60s, 70s and 80s, focused on particular sectors. Um, and in Latin America, this was very much also around import substitution models of development. And the idea is instead of focusing on particular sectors that you think you're gonna become great at, because sometimes by the time you do that, the sector has changed and you're again, too late, the idea is to really use the, the problem setting uh, 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 role to define that kind of directional shift. So you're choosing problems, not sectors, and increasing the capacity of all your sectors to work together towards solving those problems. These are problems around, again, issues around inequality, the digital divide, a climate transition. And it's hard to think of any sector that's not going to be important and say a climate of related strategy. But similarly around health, if you think of all the preventative uh, areas that need investing in, you know, that would of course include all sorts of different sectors around food, uh, uh, lifestyle, and so on. Um, I've already talked about missions. Let me just move on because I want to get here. So what we ended up doing in the Institute, I want to make sure we give enough time for discussion. And in the discussion, please ask me in Spanish I, um, and I'll respond in English, but feel free to ask me any questions in Spanish. We asked ourselves, what does it mean to bring this concept of missions to the design of the institutions, right? So a public bank, okay? Like in Brazil, I worked with a public bank called BNDS. Uh, the BNDS actually had different phases in its history, including where the funding came from. But one of the phases I looked at was very similar to the Italian uh, phase of public banking, which is just money being given out <laughs> to the companies that need help because they're failing, yeah? So it becomes a subsidy, a handout, a guarantee to pretty bad companies that are struggling because they're not very innovative. How do you transform a public bank to be mission-oriented so it's providing patient long-term finance to those companies that are willing to change, to transform, to collaborate, around these public missions. So you have conditionality embedded in the structure of the loans. This is something that the German public bank, the KFW did in recent years, um, where they provided loans to the steel industry, conditional on the steel industry lowering its material content. 
in order to adapt to the mission being set by the government around energy vende for a green transition. And the steel industry in Germany has become one of the most innovative in the world because in order to reduce the material content and the carbon emissions that they had to do to receive a public loan, they had to innovate. They innovated through new technology and techniques and services to introduce repurpose, reuse and recycle across the whole value chain. And they did it because they had to in order to get the loan, not because they were just you know, very good participants in society. So we helped set up a whole new bank in Scotland where we, uh, because Scotland, like the rest of the UK, doesn't have patient finance. There's lots of short-term finance. Uh, so patient long-term finance from the public bank that was mission-oriented and the Scottish economy is interesting because at the macro level, they have the Scotland National Performance Framework, similar to New Zealand, which has used the SDGs to set targets for the country. And so, you know, the fact that the public bank is designing the loans in order to foster transition towards these SDG areas is very interesting. Similarly, we just wrote a report this month, myself and Olga Mikiva, with the European Investment Bank, because in Europe, the bank is now calling itself the Climate Bank focused on the circular economy. So we looked at what that actually meant for the structure of its loans. Um, so again, we can't have missions without then asking what does it mean for changing how we give out loans, grants, and design procurement. Um, and in Italy, this is Giuseppe Conte. He's actually more good looking in person than I thought. Uh, <laughs> I'm his uh, special advisor. And I've been helping the country think through how to receive and adapt to the European recovery plans around the green transition in this moment of COVID-19, where the recovery funds are conditional on having a strategy. And so I wrote a, a report with them and um, it was very interesting because of, you know, the tendency in Italy has been to do the opposite of what I'm talking about. Instead of starting with the strategy and then crowding in the, the projects, they have a lot of projects, <laughs> you know, reining in on the government, which then after the fact has to create a strategy on top of them. And that becomes very hard. If you have a fully bottom up process, uh, it becomes very hard for the sum to amount to anything greater than all the individual parts. So this has been a big challenge in Italy, especially given the static public private uh, relationship where there's lots of expectations in the private sector to simply get help from the government as opposed to transform. Um, and this really brings me to this question of public value, because when you admit that value is co-created between different actors, instead of just thinking it's created in business and then redistributed from government or fixing markets, it really does require asking different questions, asking questions around directionality, which I talked about, organizational capacity, so flexibility, adaptability, new ways of doing accounting, new ways of doing assessment, how we evaluate our policies outside of a static cost-benefit analysis, but also, and I wanted to focus a bit on this now, sharing of risks and rewards. So, you know, how do you actually develop mechanisms so the public and private sectors are really co-creating the value together, sharing the risks, but also the rewards? And, and I do think this is a very important pillar for Latin America, for the reasons I said before, which is that at least countries with progressive governments have not thought enough about how we create wealth differently. There's been too much focus on redistribution, you know, which is very important. I believe strongly in redistribution, progressive policies, but there's nothing to redistribute <laughs> if we don't create wealth uh, in, in a different way. Um, and so I just wanted to focus a bit on that also because I write a lot about it in my book on value. And this is really about thinking, you know, once you have public investment through a public bank, innovation agency, or different types of programs like guaranteed loans, what is the new relationship with the private sector? For example, conditionalities on making sure that the profits earned by the private sector are actually reinvested back into production and not siphoned out, extracted. That's why I, the subtitle of my book was Making and Taking in the Global Economy. Or what does it mean for how we govern intellectual property rights, patents? 
so that they are not abused simply to extract rents, but really foster more innovation and diffusion. What does it mean for the ability of government to, in some cases, retain equity? Equity in the investments they make. So in the US case, Obama gave as much money to Tesla as he did to Solyndra. But Solyndra went bust, bankrupt. The taxpayer bailed them out, $500 million. Tesla, successful, the money just went to Elon Musk. And so what was interesting was that Obama said to Elon Musk, if you don't pay back the loan, we get 3 million shares in your company, which was a stupid thing to say. You know, stupid assumptions lead to stupid policies. <laughs> he should have said, if you pay the loan back, which they did, we get 3 million shares in your company. And the price per share between 2009, 2013 went from nine to 90. And that difference multiplied by 3 million would have more than paid back the Solyndra loss in the next round. So that way of thinking, portfolio minded, investor first resort, co-creating alongside the private sector, but also sharing the rewards, not just the risks, is the change in mindset. So it's not about public ownership and nationalize everything. You know, it's actually about sharing together, both public and private, the rewards that are fostered from this public risk taking. And this is especially when it's downstream investments. If it's upstream investments like in research and development, the return is as much spillover and, you know, a uh, 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 spillover of the knowledge as possible. But when companies are receiving the money from the public sector, there's no reason why you can't set it up like a venture capitalist would with a portfolio and making sure you get some of the, the upside to fund the downside and so on. Um, and this moment of COVID-19, I think is a very interesting moment to think about this because in many parts of the world, there's huge amounts of money being put into the system, especially to save those sectors which will you know, go bankrupt without state support. But how do you introduce conditionality into that relationship so the state is not just bailing out those that need immediate help, but you know, really creating some sort of um, new relationship? And I think this is the moment because for two years now, the large global corporates who have operations everywhere in Peru as well, don't think of them as American corporates. These are global corporates with value chains everywhere are talking about changing their business model to be more purpose driven. And this idea of stakeholder value. So for the value to be returned to all the stakeholders, not just the shareholders is a very interesting pillar through which emissions can set up a new public private partnership. And it's a good test to you know, test the walk of the talk around stakeholder value. And you know, if you even think of the vaccine now for COVID-19 with all the global um, experiments that are happening, how we govern the vaccine to be purpose-driven matters. This is why the World Health Organization is talking about a people's vaccine that makes sure that we actually pool the patents, creating a patent pool to share as much knowledge between countries collaboratively so that we foster collective intelligence instead of just private profits, especially given how much public money is going into the vaccine itself. This would be a very different way to bring purpose into health innovation in a way that hasn't been there in the past. Even the, the COVID drug from Desavir, it's the name of the medicine being produced by Gilead, is being sold for $3,200 for dosage, <laughs> even though it was mainly publicly financed. So we've always gotten this wrong in the past. And now that we have such urgency with the vaccine, we should use this as a new way to collaborate, to structure public-private partnerships, which are goal-oriented, but get the details right of how to really partner in a symbiotic way. And the fact that some countries, like in France and Austria, they have created strong conditions attached to the, um, to the money that companies are getting, like Air France and Renault, uh, conditional on carbon reduction, is, is an interesting experiment. Uh, in, in Austria, they also said that companies that use tax havens, that avoid tax, are not able to access the COVID recovery schemes. In the US, Elizabeth Warren pushed for companies that receive COVID recovery cannot use it just to you know, distribute dividends or do share buybacks. 
And you know, in the UK, we didn't do this. We just bailed out EasyJet, 600 million, no conditions attached. So there's real heterogeneity in how countries are using this public money to leverage a different public-private symbiotic ecosystem. And I think it's very interesting to use this as a moment to do public-private differently. We are working in Spain, in a region of Spain called Biscay, because they have a very interesting um, cooperative model inside their corporate governance. And we've been talking to them about what does a cooperative model look like for a transition in society to bring trade unions, citizens, corporates and the government mm. together in new ways. And Kate Roll, who's here on the call, and some of our colleagues are also helping the school, their tax policy, the, the policies around their impuestos, for how do you actually reward certain types of behaviors in the corporate community through the tax incentives that the government can give out SDG. So let me just say that the last point of, of this lecture, because I want to open it up to questions, is that we've just started now working in Latin America around some of these concepts. It began with the report that I've been working on for the last five years, actually, with the Inter-American Development Bank, to really ask what does this look like in countries which in the past have you know, been more wed to these industrial strategies around natural resources? What does it mean to transform the question of the resource curse, <laughs> actually, to one where the resources become a very important input towards a structural transformation of the uh, economy. Um, and we looked at different examples, again, around Chile, Colombia. Uh, in Colombia, for example, they had a very interesting city level mission called Medellin, La Mas Educada, um, which really actually included lots of different um, uh, sectors. This one actually here, sorry, this one here is um, showing the one around um, sustainable and inclusive development and all the different sectors like human capital, infrastructure, universities, environment and innovation, which would have to come together to collaborate in new ways. And again, to have very specific uh, uh, goals like the one here in Chile around the mining sector, to have a virtuous, inclusive and sustainable mining to improve the quality of life of current and future generations. And you know, again, what does this look like if you take it outside of just the mining sector but have mining as part of the mission itself, but then bring all those different sectors along the way and use the policy levers to crowd in, as we saw before with the other blue circles, these different types of, um, of projects on the ground. Oops. Um, let me just go here, sorry. So really what we want to do, because I don't want to focus on, on other countries right now, because for any country, you can really think of any mission, but, but the point is that it needs to be local. It needs to be contested and brought about through citizen engagement, local, regional government interacting with uh, citizen groups, uh, interacting with business groups, but especially thinking through the existing tools, the existing levers that one has, like the public bank, like the innovation agency, like the different subsidies and guarantees to really crowd in as much as possible those bottom-up uh, uh, solutions that I've been stressing. Um, so I just saw.